Thank you very much, Aaron. Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome. Uh, I'm jolly pleased that it would go back an hour tonight because this is way past my bedtime. I don't know about you. The Sea Wolf, the French name that they gave to this man, Loup de Mer, is what they called him. Lord Thomas Cochrane, Earl of Dundonald. Now, if I met you in a bar and was having a drink with you and I told you the story of a person that I'm going to tell you tonight and I didn't tell you it was true, you'd probably buy me a drink and after I left you'd said I was completely crazy because nobody could have done what the person I told you about did. We've got the man in front of us here. I'm going to call him Thomas because I'm not going to go through all his titles and everything. Uh, if he was alive today, I'd be calling him Sir because he was a, a great man. But this is a portrait of him done in 1807 as a young man. He was a very tall man uh, for his time, blonde hair. Uh, he didn't have a formal education because his farm father uh, held a peerage, a Scottish peerage, and they had land on the other side of the Firth of Forth from Edinburgh in Scotland. And underneath the stately home that they lived in were large deposits of coal. So they lived off the mining of coal and were very wealthy Scottish peers. So young Thomas didn't get sent to school. He had private tutors. And also his father was uh, not an amateur scientist. He was a scientist um, and an inventor. But every time he invented something, he wanted to pursue the commercial prospects of it. So basically, he bankrupted himself and his family and his estates with his inventions. And one of the inventions was he turned his coal into coal tar in a particular process that if you coated the bottoms of ships with it in those days, which were wood, this is just as we were starting to put copper bottoms on wooden ships. Prior to that, they hadn't had metal, metal underneath them, and they used to get worms. So he went round all the shipyards trying to sell his coal tar process that you just had to coat the bottoms of ships with, and uh, couldn't understand why the Royal Navy and all the civilian shipyards were not buying his preparation of him. And then one of the shipyard owners said, took him to one side and he said, why would we buy something which stopped us having to repair something we'd built five years before? And he then realized that being a scientist and inventor and trying to be a businessman wasn't necessarily a good idea. But Thomas Cochrane, this is the man. Any of you read C.S. Forrester or seen Jack Aubrey's Master and Commander and those sorts of... Yes. Well, uh, I'm, a, I'm, I'm afraid most of us are of an age group when C.S. Forrester was the sort of thing that most teenage boys read. Uh, obviously a, a, a Brit, but lived in, in California. Prolific author and screenwriter as well. Wrote a number of screenplays for, for Hollywood as well as his famous Holly, uh, Hornblower series. But this is what we remember in fiction of the sort of fictional character that Thomas Crocker was. <laughs> Unfurling all the romance and excitement of C.S. Forrester's mighty saga of the seas, Warner Brothers take you before the mast with the greatest naval hero of all time. In the fabulous days when iron men hurled wooden ships into mortal combat, when history hung on the slash of a sword, and only one man stood between the tyrant Bonaparte and his dream of world conquest, Captain Horatio Hornblower. Gregory Peck, Virginia Mayo was in it. Um, as well, uh, though we don't see her in that tri tri uh, trailer for the film. And of course, Patrick O'Brien's Jack Aubrey, much, much more recent. She is taking the water to the South Seas. We are supposed to stop it. We should have turned back weeks ago. 
She could be halfway to Cape Horn by the time we repaired and underway. You there! This is a ship of war, and I will grind whatever grist the mill requires in order to fulfill my duty, whatever the cost. Have you forgotten your promise? Subject to the requirements of the service. Can you really claim there's nothing personal in this call to duty? Though we be on the far side of the world, this ship is our home. So those are the fictional characters, and virtually all of the stories that both those authors and authors before them wrote are based on the character I'm talking about tonight, Thomas Cochrane, Lord Cochrane, incredible man. There was a history of the Navy in his family. His uncle, his father's brother, was a captain in the Royal Navy, and he put uh, Thomas's name down on his ships when Thomas was three years old. And he was on the ship's muster of all the ships that his uncle captained and sailed in uh, and from the age of three until the age of 17 and a half. And that was quite normal in those days. If you were part of the gentry, you either bought yourself a commission in the army or you bought, you bought yourself a commission in the navy. The most important thing was, though, that if you bought yourself a commission, the date of your start of your service counted towards where you got to in the, uh, in the service itself. So his uncle was very wise. His father was not very happy. His father wanted him to go into the army, and indeed, his father bought him a commission in the army, and he spent a year in the army between the age of 16 and 17. But he went into the Navy at a young age, well, a relatively old age, actually, of 17 and a half. So we're going to be talking about him and his character and personality, because as you would expect, he was quite a complex character. His exploits as a seaman, um, and they are in all the Hornblower books and the, the uh, Aubrey books and, and so on, and, and, and most bits of fiction about uh, naval matters of that period are, are based on this man. But we're he wasn't just uh, a seaman. He was a politician. He, like his father, was an inventor. A criminal fraudster, question mark. That's a story in itself. And there have been two books written about that aspect of his life, but we'll look at that as well. The Admiral of Three Navies, and also eventually a rehabilitated member of the aristocracy because he was thrown out. So let's get it into context to start with and talk about the Navy itself and what he joined. The Royal Navy, it doesn't matter that you can't see all the, the uh, little titles, but this is basically an organization chart of the Royal Navy of the period between the 15th and the 20th century. Um, and it's, I'm showing it to you because uh, the, the term Britannia rules the waves is perfectly true. And the way that we did it was that we basically made it an extremely lucrative work for anybody who took part in it if they were successful through a thing called prize money. We also, it was a service of equality in a sense. You could rise from the bottom to the top. You could actually enter as a sailor or in the case of the army as a private and you could get a battlefield commission or in the case of the navy you could distinguish yourself at some naval action and get commissioned and it was perfectly possible for you to turn yourself from being a peasant to being a member of the aristocracy. And many members of the aristocracy in, this, in, the, in Britain now have come to their titles and their possessions through that route. Because not only did you get promotion by merit for the work you did in battle, but you also earned the money to pay for it. A significant number of the main stately homes in the south of England were built on prize money, the money that these men earned. And I've shown you the chart because at the top of the chart is the captain. Now, everything to do with prize money was allocations of eighths. So if you captured a ship, its cargo and the value of the ship was assessed, and then what was earned was split into eighths. Normally, two-eighths of the prize money went to the captain, unless he was given his orders by an admiral, he worked under an admiral and got those orders. If he got them directly from the admiralty, he got two-eighths 
of the prize money. If he got them from the admiral that he was working for, he got one eighth. The admiral got the other eighth. And this caused Thomas Cochrane a great deal of angst, and he got into a lot of trouble over it because he got argued quite vociferously that the system for awarding prize money was unfair because often port admirals at various parts of the world that he operated used to intercept his orders from the Admiralty in order that when he got his prize money, because he was so famous, he, he earned so much, it, when he got his prize money, they could say, I gave the order to Lord Cochrane, therefore I want my eighth. So once the two eighths went to the captain, the other eighths were parceled out to the rest of the crew. So even a sailor could earn 500 pounds from the capture of one ship. Some captains, uh, in a, a few years before uh, uh, Thomas Cochrane uh, was sailing around, a lot of gold was captured that was coming back from the Americas to Spain. And on one particular uh, capture, two captains shared 650,000 pounds in prize money in 1790. And that, in today's money, you could probably add six noughts to it. So sizable sums of money. And that's what motivated Thomas Cochrane particularly. He was, he was almost obsessed by prize money. He was obsessed by a number of other things as well, but he was almost obsessed by it. Now, you'd think it all ended. Prize money must have ended a long time ago. Prize money was still going on. It was formally sort of stopped in 1918. But the last ship to be awarded prize money was a United States Navy ship in 1947 for a ship that it uh, captured in 1945. So it's quite a recent thing as well. And would you believe that also the Royal Air Force managed to go to a prize court and get prize uh, money for an aircraft capturing a ship during the Second World War, flying over it until the Royal Navy came along. The Royal Navy tried to claim the prize money and the Royal Air Force took them to court. So that's how important prize money is. So let's first look at life in the Navy. It's been portrayed in the films that we've seen and in the books that we've read as a very, very hard life. In actual fact, it was a pretty stable life. And compared to the peasant's life in Britain at the time, it could be actually quite uh, a, a rewarding life. Um, the pay and conditions were quite sparse, um, but they were better than many people receiving uh, on their land-based jobs. The rates of the ships depended on how big they were and where they were in, the, in the, the rating structure. There was a fair amount of corruption. I've, I've talked about the prize money, but there was other, other types of corruption as well. And there was a, I mean, putting your um, brother's child on the register of your ship when he's only three is a pretty good form of nepotism, if you, if you like it. But they had a certain amount of welfare and care that they certainly didn't have back in their villages at home. Um, they had people looking after them. They had regular food. They did have regular wages. They had regular grog, drink. They wouldn't sail. Certainly the, the, the Royal Navy, up until relatively recently, uh, had a rum ration every day. And they, of course, left a legacy of the Britannia ruling the waves, and the Royal Navy still uh, operates at a very high level of expertise as a result of what the people that I'm talking about did. And life in the Navy at that time was very, very formalized in the Royal Navy, which was why the Royal Navy was so superior to the navies that it was fighting, particularly the Spanish and the French. We've just come out of Cadiz. It was interesting, when we were sitting in the port there, I, I said to Rosemary, my wife, when we were sitting looking out at the port, I said, this, uh, this is a glorious day, but can you imagine being in the Royal Navy on a sailing ship for six months at a time, whatever the weather, just outside the bay here at Cadiz, making sure that the French and the Spanish fleets do not leave, or if they do leave, over the horizon is a fleet waiting for them, which has also been sitting there for six months, resupplied backwards and forwards from England. They didn't go home for six months. They spent a whole six months blockading French ports. So it was a hard life. And the way to keep them trained was to train them and keep them working rigorously. A ship of war, unlike a commercial 
transport ship. Um, we talk about the large crew to passenger ratio on a cruise liner like this. On a ship of war, it has something like five times more people than it needs to actually sail the ship. It needs the other four times to fight the ship. So just sailing the ship means that the rest of them, if they weren't kept busy, would have an awful lot of time in their hands and they would get stale very quickly, which is what happened to the French and Spanish fleets because they were not sailing a lot. The British fleet was constantly blockading. It was constantly at sea, so the men were constantly being worked. It was a stinking place to work and stinking place to be, um, below decks particularly, and particularly on some of the smaller ships. Bullying was rife, and uh, cobbing, which was um, like a, a gauntlet that you would run through and all your mates would hit you with, with uh, the end of a rope and, and, and so on, um, for, for minor infractions. The minor infractions were usually to do of a lack of social responsibility. The fact that you did not give personal space to your mate who only wanted an inch. Or you didn't recognize that other people had to live in your area and you were, you were um, selfish in your behavior or whatever. Those sorts of things. In port, there were a lot of women on board. Often during the blockade, often during the battles, big battles like the Battle of Trafalgar, a sizable number of women were on board. They were never on the uh, manifest. Um, but lots of terms come out of uh, naval slang, and showing a leg, of course, is the, the most typical, um, which they used to shout as they went through the ship as they were leaving port um, to make sure there were no women left in the hammocks. Discipline was harsh, but I think over the years we've come to believe that it was much harsher than it really was. And we think of flogging, and, and uh, it wasn't common. Flogging, there were about 20 cases a year. Um, the maximum number of lashes that a captain could give was regulated, although some very rare captains were known as flogging captains, and they, they gave more than was necessary or was allowed. But it was usually between 12 and 24 lashes. Um, but occasionally it, it got worse than that. The worst possible punishment, apart from just being hung, was being flogged around the fleet. And that way you would be taken in a dinghy from ship to ship, and in front of the crews of all the ships you would be flogged publicly, and when you fainted you would be taken back and revived, and then a week or so later when you were well enough to be flogged again you would be taken to another bunch of ships, and slowly and slowly, and it was basically a death sentence. But it was so, so rarely done. And you've probably heard of keel hauling. Keel hauling was uh, a punishment where you were, uh, the man was attached to a rope and he was hauled from the aft end of the ship right the way under the keel to the forward end with all the barnacles and everything, and very, very few people survived that. But it was extremely rare. It was, it was not common. Punishment was, was, was pretty frequent to keep the men in order and to keep the discipline. And some offences were extremely serious. Striking a senior officer or a senior rank of any kind was extremely serious. Obviously, murder was very serious. Um, theft was considered very th serious when you have lots of people living very close together. But it's been portrayed, particularly in film over the years, um, probably incorrectly for... This is, is probably the most famous one. It's indifference to me whether you contaminate the natives or the natives contaminate you. I have but one concern. Our mission, let any one of you provoke an incident which endangers it, and I shall cause that man to pass his mother for giving him. That was, of course, Bly. Bly was court-martialed as a result of losing the bounty, and he was exonerated, and he was praised. He got his, his crew that, that went with him, his loyal crew, um, 700, 800 miles on open ocean, and navigating by dead reckoning. Um, incredible. So let's get back to Thomas. He quit his army's commission, as I said, and he joined a little ship called the Hind. And when he went on board as a 17 and a half year old, as you almost see him in that photograph at the beginning, he walked on board and he saw it was um, at um, Deptford um, in, in London where he joined the ship. And he went on board and he saw uh, lots of seamen working, um, doing ropes and rigging and all that sort of, getting the ship ready for, for, for sea. Um, and uh, he went up to one of the seamen, um, who was dressed in ordinary shirt and, and trousers and no, no shoes, and told him he was the new midshipman, aged 17 and a half, which was old, 
are usually 12 or 13 years old. He was 17 and a half. Turned out that this seaman he was talking to was the first lieutenant. Um, he had boarded, and the first lieutenant, John Larmor, was working with the ordinary seaman because he was one of those men that I told you about who had been promoted from the lower deck. So he was a fantastic tutor for young Thomas. And funnily enough, they hit it off immediately. Um, one from, if you like, a peasant class and the other from an arist aristocratic class. They hit it off immediately, even though John Larmor was, was quite a, a, a strong um, character. He took young Thomas under his wing and he taught him everything he knew about building ships, rigging ships, seamanship, sailing them, the, the sail making. He made sure that Thomas learned all the trades that he had learned as a seaman, which was not normal for a midshipman to be taught. So Lama took him under his wing. And in his biography, Thomas Cochrane gives great credit to, to the first lieutenant of the hind um, because his whole character was built as a result of this man taking him under his wing. He had the respect of the men because he was such a brilliant seaman. And some of the exploits that he carried out were as a result of his ability to maneuver his ship when other captains wouldn't have been able to. It, between March 1800 and July 1801, he um, commanded the HMS Speedy, Speedy, which was a tiny little sloop. It was so small and he was so tall that when he went into his cabin, in order to shave in the morning, he would stick his head through the skylight in the ceiling out onto the deck and he would shave in the open air with the window open because he couldn't stand up in his cabin. He distinguished himself significantly while he was uh, captain of the Speedy, or master of the Speedy. Um, we've got a four, 14 four-pound guns and 84 men. And he captured, in 15 months, more than 50 ships, 122 guns, and 534 prisoners, without very, very little damage or, or deaths to his own crew. Throughout his career, people wanted to sail with Thomas Cochrane because he brought his men home. He very rarely had lost any men, and that got him into trouble, would you believe? On the 6th of May, 1801, though, he got into the newspapers for the first time in Britain because he took his tiny little sloop under the frigate El Gamo. And there's a painting here. And the frigate is the little black ship at the front. El Gamo is behind. And he did what he's, he, you, you, his career is starting to map out as to how it's going to go in the future. He used the ruse de guerre. He put up a Danish flag and he sailed his Danish fl flagged ship up to El Gamo, a large frigate, lar well armed, well, well crewed, got closer and closer, and he'd found somebody uh, in port when he was recruiting who could speak Danish. So he dressed this seaman who could speak Danish in clothes that looked like the master, stood him on the, fo on the foredeck, and got him to shout in Danish to the French, that they were a friend and they were neutral and they were coming in with cargo and so on, or got so close to El Gamo that her guns were above his little ship. So when they were fired, they went through his rigging and they went through the, above the deck and his crew. And every time they tried to board him, because they significantly outnumbered him, he would maneuver the ship away and back again, always keeping it so close that it wasn't able to be shot at himself by the larger ship. And he actually captured the ship. It got in all the newspapers at home. He got a significant amount of prize money. Um, and he got promoted. And he ends up being so famous that when he gets HMS Palace, a frigate with 26 12-pound guns and 12 24-pound coronades, deck guns that, that spread shot, don't come out of the side of the ship, when he needed to raise a crew, all he did was post posters like this all around I'll read it to you because it's, it's great fun. My lads, the rest of the galleons with the treasure from La Plata are waiting half-loaded at Cartagena. We passed Cartagena yesterday. For the arrival of those from Peru and Panama, and soon as that takes place, they are to sail to Porto Velo to take in the rest of their cargo with provisions and water for the voyage to Europe. 
They may stay at Porto Velo a few days. Such a chance perhaps will never occur again. The flying palace of 36 guns at Plymouth is a new and uncommonly fine frigate built on purpose and ready for an expedition as soon as some more good hands are on board. Captain Lord Cochrane, who was not drowned in the Arab, as reported, he's been in the paper constantly, so they all know who he is, commands her. The sooner you are on board, the better. Now apply, but, but uh, seamen or stout hands, also able and about the field piece, it, able to carry the field pieces and carry 100 weight of pewter without stopping. Then it says Cochrane, and to finish seamen, Boney's coronation is postponed. This is the sort of thing he would do, and people would flock to sail with him. And sure enough, raising the crew was no big problem, and between January and April 1805, he got £40,000 in prize money in that short period of time, capturing everything that moved along the Spanish coast that we've been, we've been travelling. And this perfected his skills as a captain. But he was very concerned about various things that were happening in the Royal Navy, uh, prize money being one, the, the prize money system being one, the corruption in it. Also the rank system, the fact that your rank depended totally on the date of your promotion, therefore not so um, wise or, or um, clever men were promoted in front of much cleverer men merely because they had been posted earlier. So he went, decided he'd do something about this and he went to be elected a member of parliament. And we had in those days what were called pot walloper boroughs. Um, those who could vote, and of course in those days not that many people could vote, it was prim primarily landowners. Those who could vote were given money by the candidates to vote for them. What Thomas Cochrane did was he didn't give anybody any money, he put his name down as the candidate. And when the election was over and he lost, he went to, and his, his, his opponent had given all of the people that voted for him, or given everybody, five guineas, five pounds, five shillings, had given everybody to vote for him. After the election, he gave all the people who had voted for him, the minority, because he didn't get in, ten guineas. When they had the next election, six months later, everybody voted for Thomas Cochrane, thinking they were going to get ten guineas. So he was voted in, and he didn't give anybody anything. What he did was he told them that that was one of the things he wanted to abolish when he got to the House of Commons, the rotten boroughs that called potwallop boroughs where you could buy yourself into the election. They didn't like that but, very much, but it didn't bother Thomas because in May 1807, he got elected in his own right to a non-paying borough, the borough of Westminster, within which the Houses of Parliament are. He got elected the Member of Parliament for, um, for there. So that was in 1807, and he remained Member of Parliament throughout his naval career until 1818, his Royal Naval career. He then became Commander, still as a Member of Parliament, of HMS Imperials. And on the map there, it's Spain, all the dots are places that he um, operated into. This is a period when the, the French army was on the Iberian Peninsula, um, the Spaniards were allied with the British, um, and this road um, that Bill Simpson talked about in his first talk, uh, the Roman road that comes along the coast, was absolutely vital for the French to resupply their garrisons, particularly in Barcelona. Um, and all he did was he would sail with his marines and a few seamen and blow up the road, or build a, bring a landslide down onto the road, or attack them along with the guerrillas and the revolutionary um, army of Spain. Anything to obstruct the French army all the way down the coast. He was also still after prize money. So he would make extremely daring raids into all the ports that we've been past. Every time he would do reconnaissances up and down, a very nimble ship he had, a small frigate. Uh, he'd do reconnaissances up, up, up and down. He'd stop fishermen and ask them which ships were in which ports. And then at night, he would send in cutting out expeditions. 
And he was constantly sending prize crews back with relatively small cargo vessels that were coasters going up and down the coast with, again, supplies for the French. He'd send them back to, to Minorca, to Port Mahon, which was the British base at the time, and then reap in the prize money. So he had a very, very successful cruise uh, in the Western Mediterranean, but he became at odds with authority. Uh, he criticized his superiors on a regular basis. Nobody was exempt from Thomas Cochrane's criticism, going right up to the first sea lord. One place that I'll tell you a little bit more about was the Siege of Rosas. This is Fort Trinidad as you would see it today. And if you look at it, it's got a big white patch in it. That white patch is the repair from the um, uh, French cannon when Cochrane occupied that fort, expecting the, the Spanish Revolutionary Army and their guerrillas to assist him in holding it against the French and therefore stopping them getting south to Barcelona. They blew a hole in the side of it, and he and his marines and seamen were inside. But it's quite high up, that hole. So he knew that the French were going to attack him through the, the, the hole they'd blasted in the wall. So he left the hole wide open, and he got his carpenters to build a slide on the inside of the hole, and then to wedge into the slide along the grain broken glass. He then covered, had the slide covered with grease and waited for the French to attack. And, of course, held the fort for a significant amount of time before he left it. So he was, a, he was the first, one of the first people to do what we would call today combined operations. He worked with other armies, with, with what we would now call special forces. Um, he came up with all, all sorts of innovative ways, which we would now consider to be terribly cruel, but they were very effective. But he got in big trouble here. He had this, he, like his father, he was an inventor. So he, um, he invented what he called stink ships and gas ships, um, coating hulks with clay and then putting potassium and sulfur and all sorts of noxious materials inside, setting them on fire and then sending them through uh, as fire ships to not only... Uh, burn the enemy, but also to gas him. Um, he did this at the Basque Roads uh, in 1802 um, and, uh, uh, sorry, 1809, on the 11th of April, a night attack. But his, the admiral of the fleet that he was a part of wouldn't support him. About six months later, it was a very successful battle. The French fleet was completely crippled by Cochrane but he did it with four other ships, none of the main fleet. And every time he looked towards the main fleet, which was out at sea, he expected a, a signal from Gambier, the, the, the commander-in-chief, uh, to come back, to come out, because he didn't support him. But he kept signaling him, saying, bring your ships in and we can completely rout the whole French fleet. And he refused. So Cochrane was left on his own to do the job on his own, which he did against the orders of, the, of his commander-in-chief. A few months later in Parliament, they moved to um, have a, a, a vote of um, a congratulations to the commander-in-chief for the wonderful action that took place in the Basque Roads. And Cochrane voted against it and said the man had nothing whatsoever to do with it and tried to stop me do it. And that's not what you do to what is going to become the future sea, uh, first sea lord, the head of the... Uh, head of the Navy. His exploits are of a, as, a, as a politician. He also made many enemies. He wanted to completely reform the House of Commons, their expenses system, their rights, their subsidies, all sorts of things. Everything that you could think of that would upset his colleagues, he stood up to fight against. He was considered a radical. As an inventor, he also invented a thing called the, the temporary mortar and explosion ship, where he got a hulk and, and weighted it so that it was on it at an angle, and then you basically set fire to it, and the whole contents of the ship was made up of cannonballs, rockets, sulfur, gas, oil, and that would all get projected over any barrier or boom and on top of whatever the fleet was in the harbour. He also invented smoke screens and a convoy lamp, some of you might remember in both Aubrey's and Forrester's, uh, C.S. Forrester's Hornbow, 
the story of the nighttime chase where they put a barrel with a lighter behind the ship um, and uh, being chased by a bigger ship. And when darkness falls, they let the barrel go so that the ship following follows the light, not the ship that they're in. That's what Cochrane did on numerous occasions. He was also into tubular boilers and steam engines, all sorts of stuff. But the stock exchange fraud is what he got um, most famous for. Um, the stock exchange was only 13 years old when uh, this happened. And it was the first regulated stock exchange in the world. Prior to then, most stocks had been exchanged in coffee houses um, by people who anybody could set themselves up as a broker. The stock exchange in London was the first subscription regulated stock exchange. And uh, in 1814, there were a lot of rumors that Napoleon had been killed um, towards the end of the Napoleonic Wars. It was likely that you know, he might be because he, things were going against him. A fraud was perpetrated on the stock exchange by a man landing at Dover and then asking immediately, claiming to be from the army against Napoleon, and asking for semaphore signals, which is how the telegraph was operated in those days, to be sent to London that Napoleon was dead. And it was a blatant attempt to alter the price of government bonds, to change the market price of the stock exchange bonds. Unfortunately, it was foggy. So the semaphore signals might have been sent, but nobody received them. So this fellow got into a post carriage and started the long, fastest journey you could make to London from Dover, but stopped at regular intervals at posting houses and immediately went into the bar and instead of getting his ale and getting back in the coach, started to spin this story about Napoleon being dead. Anyway, his cover was blown eventually, but not before a few people had made a quite a significant amount of money on one of the government bonds, and one of them was Thomas Cochrane. So then all his enemies came out of the woodwork. He was tried, convicted of fraud, sentenced to 12 months and a thousand pound fine. He was supposed to be pilloried. The stock exchange used to be in the Royal Exchange in those days, where if you go to London opposite the Bank of England in Threadneedle Street is the is the is the Royal Exchange. As you come out of Bank Tube Station, right in front of you of the Royal Exchange. He was supposed to be pilloried outside that, stuck in the stocks and, and everybody was they were so frightened that the public would riot that this very famous and much-loved man was going to be pilloried that they didn't inflict that punishment on him. He was voted out of the House of Commons. He was expelled. He was a Knight of the Bath. And if you're a Knight of the Bath, you have a banner in Westminster Abbey. When you go into Westminster Abbey next, look above the choir stalls, and there are banners of all the Knights of the Bath. So Cochrane's banner was up in there. When you have that taken off you, they don't just take it down. They take it down and ceremonially rip it up and kick it down the steps of Westminster Abbey into the street. And that's what they did with Thomas Cochrane's banner when he was expelled from the Order of the Bath. Comes out of prison. He becomes an admiral in four different navies. He is a revered person in Chile. He was a hero to this day. Three Chilean ships have been named after Thomas Cochrane. They have a day every year where they go and, and, and stand in front of his grave in Westminster Abbey um, and have a special ceremony. He fought the classic sea battles in the Pacific that he'd fought in the Mediterranean. He forced the Spanish to give up the continent by taking the last major warship they had, capturing it for the Chilean government, then argued with them about the prize money and left under a cloud because he wouldn't agree the amount they, they offered him. He then went uh, to Brazil and pushed the Portuguese out of Brazil by subterfuge, and then attacked the convoy they were leaving Brazil in in order to claim the prizes for the ships and all the cargo they contained as they took all their people back to Portugal. Then he went to Greece and tried to introduce steamships during their re re revolution against the Ottoman Empire, and constantly, every time he finished one of these contracts, he argued about how much they were going to pay him. Eventually, he managed to, because he still had many, many friends, and he was a character, and I'm sure if, if you'd known him, you would have really enjoyed his company and so on. He was eventually pardoned, and he was reinstated as an admiral, and he was even reinstated as a Knight of the Bath. And he eventually was buried with, he had an operation for gallstones and didn't survive him, but he was, he was not a young man when he, when he died. In 1832, he's pardoned by the Crown, reinstated 
in the Royal Navy, and they upped his rank as he got a bit older. Um, there was talk of him commanding the Navy uh, in the Crimean War, um, not the Crimean bit, the bit that was going on in, in the Baltic against the Russians at the same time, the Baltic fleet. Um, but they thought he was a too dangerous a person to put in charge of that. He might um, do something that would embarrass the British government. There's a statue of him in Valparaiso. So what do we think of him? Well, I no doubt he was an accomplished seaman. He's a character. He's a person that you really want to invite around for dinner just to hear what he had to say. He sounds a really nice guy as well. His men absolutely loved him. He lost very few of them. He was definitely heroic. How he didn't end up like Nelson with only one arm and one eye, we don't know. He was an easygoing character when young, but he got very grouchy when he got older. He was a poor husband and father. He had six, six children, um, and his wife Katie, or Kitty as he called her, um, eventually um, didn't leave him, but she just didn't live with him. He was paranoid about plots against him, possibly uh, justifiably because there were so many, but uh, he was really paranoid about them. And sadly, I put a question mark at the very beginning of the presentation. A book was written four or five years ago which had access to the lawyer's records, who, the lawyer still exists, who represented um, uh, Cochrane at his trial for fraud. And uh, an author was given total access to all the papers. And I'm afraid his conclusion was that Thomas Cochrane was every bit as good at defrauding the stock exchange as he was at fighting the Spanish, the French, the, the Portuguese. Um, and the, the sort of ruse de guerre that he used um, against those navies, he used um, in, the, in the stock exchange. But there is no question that he was a great man. And I'm happy to say that the day before his funeral, his banner was re-erected in Westminster Abbey. Thank you, Lee. I'm happy to take any questions at the back or whenever you see me around the ship. And my next talk will be as we pass the Atlantic U-boat bases, I'll be talking about what it must have been like to be a U-boat man um, in the Second World War. Thank you.